All right, well, we'll make sure the microphone works all right. So uh, museum people in the back, you can hear okay? Okay, we're good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is going to be really fun. I hope we have a, a good evening tonight. I've spoken to, to this uh, topic several times before, and we're going to go back to some of the facts, some of the slides I showed some while ago about uh, how we predicted the ship was going to turn out. And uh, there are a whole variety of different things we're going to try tonight, some experiments, some new, uh, some new thoughts in uh, how we work with the ship and how we work with the audience. And ordinarily at this point is when I now tell you to turn off your cell phones. And I usually, you know, pull it out and say, you know, anybody whose cell phone rings has to bake cookies for everybody. But we're going to do something different tonight. Instead of turning them off, I want you to silence them. And for those of you who know what I'm talking about here, go on to Twitter, use the hashtag Sekuliak, and tell us tonight how things are going. This is going to work well with the research project afterwards. UAF is monitoring this. We're sort of going to do a crowdsourcing thing to see how this works. So instead of me telling you don't pay attention to your cell phone, please do pay attention to your cell phone. Tweet to uh, hashtag Sekuliak. And if you have no idea what I was just talking about, don't worry about it, OK? <laughs> we'll be fine. I wanted to tell you about the Museum of the North. I sort of cribbed the title a little bit from the large exhibit that we have going on there for a whole year at the museum. It's been up, it'll be up for another th three or four months. And it's the Arctic Odysseys, the Voyages of the Sekuliak. It's a wonderful mock-up of some of the experiments, some of the different projects that are going on, the history of the ship. You see videos, uh, you get to see me doing a couple things here and there, and you can do all sorts of cool stuff with the kids. Please try to go to the museum. And in the back of the room, there are, there's information about the exhibit and then all sorts of other marine mammal and other uh, uh, hands-on touching items you can see either if you do get to go see the ship uh, or afterwards. So the ship itself, you could go to this website if you want to see interesting things about it. You can go to the museum and or best of all, you can try to get to catch Can Juno or Seward inside this next month. And we're going to talk about that there because it is on its way. It is just about a day or two now outside of Catch Can on its way here. It is finally, after 35 years, going to be in Alaska waters very, very soon. Now, ordinarily at this point, what we do is I set up, uh, sort of set up the story and go, let's talk about issues that we've got to face in the polar regions around the world, uh, talk about issues of what the, what the ice is doing around the Antarctic. This is a picture of the Earth taken by the Apollo astronauts uh, on the way to the moon. You can see South America here, uh, the Antarctic here. You can't quite see the, the Arctic, of course. And talk about all the different concerns and the marine focuses and why we want to be in the Arctic. And if this was a, a talk about the different research questions, issues of climate change, issues of subsistence, uh, changes in the Arctic sea ice, ocean acidification, uh, public perception and information, permafrost issues, we'd go for that for the next 45 minutes. And at the end, I would say, and we got a great ship that can work with it. We're going to flip that over here for the moment and just say, yes, there are many, many issues in the north, many, many issues in the ice on both polar regions, lots of things for research scientists to do. And the question to ask is, how do we work in such a large and remote area? And you can do satellite work. You can do uh, uh, underwater remote robots. You can do aerial robots. You can do all sorts of work. But ultimately, the reason we're here tonight to talk about it is we go to sea in ships. And we want to see and get ourselves out there so that we're the ones rolling around on the deck and trying not to throw up and, and not get seasick and do all the work you have to do. Believe me, the very first time I went to sea, six weeks on a cruise, the first two days I'm so sick that I'm going, well, that's it, I'm going to die because I can't be sick for six weeks. This is going to be really, really bad. And luckily the first mate told me some tricks and I was able to survive and I'm still here today, so it, it does work. But when you're out there, it's tough, except when you're in sea ice. And I can tell you when you're an icebreaker in sea ice and you're moving through, just like the Sekuliak's going to do, it is just as stable as this room is here right now. In fact, in many cases, you cannot tell that you're actually moving. So if any of you do not like to be at sea on ships that are doing this, you want to sign up to be on an icebreaker. That's what you want to do. Okay, now the other thing I do is I'm really compulsive about the talks I've always given over all the years. So uh, the last talk I gave for the Science for Alaska series, actually we exported to Anchorage also. So I did the export to Anchorage, was in April of 2011. And it was about high latitude marine research the next 10 years, and it was all those topics I was talking about. But mainly I was 
uh, spinning up this new great research vessel that we were going to build called the research vessel Sekuliak and all the cool things that was going to be happening with that ship. So what is that? Four years ago now was when uh, I started talking about the, the possibilities of this ship. And at that time, we knew the launch date was going to be in October, roughly October, November 12. We, it turned out that we did launch it in, uh, in mid-October of 12, and I'll show you some video of that. We constructed it in Marinette on the Great Lakes. We're going to look at some interesting components about having it built there. And just so you know, it's about 260 feet, 50 feet across, can take a crew of about uh, 24, scientists about 26. It has the ability, it's what we call the ability to be ice capable. It can break ice up to about a meter thick, about as thick as, as, as your chair is tall here. And the name of the ship is based upon that. In fact, the person that suggested the name, Bob Elsner, is sitting in the back of the room here and has been working on this project for 30 years. It was one of his very first dreams and his dream is coming true. You'll see pictures of him tonight. Sekuliak is an Inupiat name that means first year sea ice that is safe enough for a man to walk on. And that's just about the type of ice that it's going to be breaking as it's working through. Now the funny thing is that I'm not a linguist. So I was on, a, nor, nor specialist in, in, in Inupiat. So I was on an Alaska Airlines flight a couple months ago and was sitting next to an Inupiat woman from Barrow and she was going down to do some work in Anchorage and I was on there and she knew about the ship and, and she said, what do you do? And I said, oh, I work at the university and I've spent a lot of time on the Sekuliak. She goes, on the what? And I said, the Sekuliak. And she goes, the what? I don't understand what you're saying. So I spelled it out and then she said it. And of course, I couldn't understand what she said, you know, either. <laughs> and so, we, and so our, our linguists have said, I, you just can't reproduce the sounds. Just call it Sekuliak, you'll be safe. And uh, that's, that's, that's what we call it. And so interesting story about that. So at that time, four years ago, we had models, computer-generated models of the ship. And we talked about uh, what the hull was going to look like, these very interesting screws in the back in terms of being able to, uh, to drive the ship. You'll notice that there's no rudder in the back, and we're going to explain why that's the case. And these are called Z-Drive units. We had to buy those four years ahead of time before we actually started building the ship because the gears that work there you can imagine the engines over here, it's driving a, a shaft that turns and comes down and then these turn and these can turn in any direction. Those are the same gears that they use in all the big windmills around the world. And so we knew there was about a three to four year lag time just on getting the gears for these things. So we had to spend the $12 million for the two, uh, for the two gears, for these two screws four years ahead of time before we even started building the ship, simply because of that lag time. So at that time, again, in 2010 and 2011, we had had the signing of the contract and the chancellor and everybody signing it. We got the money through the Stimulus uh, uh, Act. It was being going to be funded by the National Science Foundation, but we ended up getting it through the Recovery Act. And it will not cost $200 million. It's going to be $199 million and some change on this one because we were told that it will not cost $200 million. National Science Foundation owns it. We operate it. We have the contract to build and the contract to operate. So the University of Alaska Fairbanks is running the ship for the National Science Foundation. It's their ship. They pay the bills. They buy the fuel. Uh, they do the whole thing. We send them the bill at the end of the year for how much it costs. It's as if we ran the Hubble Space Telescope. It's not ours. They're on contract to NASA. We're on contract to the National Science Foundation. It goes around the world. It is the only ice-capable research vessel in the entire United States fleet. And that's the thing that makes it really unique. That's the thing that makes it uh, so much fun in terms of its mission. And it has a global mission. It's a global class operation, go anywhere in the world. And uh, hopefully, its home, well, its home base will be in Seward. Hopefully, it won't be in Seward very often because it's actually going to be out doing work. We're modeling it right now at being at sea 270 days a year, roughly. So that's the ballpark. And it's already booked for all of 15 and about half of 16 at this point. And we're still working on, on times beyond that. So how do you build a ship? This was pretty cool. They started after the drawings, they built the plywood version of it first. Of all the different interesting, uh, like the bridge and the labs and everything. And, and uh, so here's somebody standing here in one of the control rooms. We're here in back of one of the labs. And it was very interesting to be able to walk through the ship 
in a great big warehouse but built out of plywood to start with. And the reason they did that, it was fascinating. I'm not a CAD, uh, a CAD, I'm not, my, no, I guess I'm not a CAD anyway, but, but CAD, uh, a computer aided design person. But they said that even when you've got wonderful three-dimensional abilities to work on a ship, the ability to stand inside it and see something makes a whole difference. So they mocked up the bridge, they mocked up a bunch of the labs in order to see how is this going to work. And sure enough, you know, the bridge is 52, actually I think the bridge is about 55 feet wide. And you've got to be able to drive it from the center or from the starboard on the right side or from the port on the left side. Okay, think about that for a second. You're the master, you're there in the center and you've got to be able to see the two you know, sides on the, on the other end of it. We found out in the plywood version that there was an elevator in the way, and so if you're standing there you know, being Captain Kirk driving the ship with your joystick, and you need to see the port drive or the, uh, maybe the first mate on the right-hand side, the starboard side driving, you couldn't see them. So we have to move the elevator back, we have to change some designs for windows, because the ability to actually walk in it made a huge difference. And if you're curious as to what happened to all that plywood, this is in Wisconsin, so it's now a whole bunch of deer hunting shacks uh, out, in the, out in the wilderness. So we built it as modules. This was fascinating. I had no idea how a ship was built. I was under the impression, you know, you sort of build the hull, and you have all the ribs, and you start putting things on. It turns out that they build it in great big modules, great big blocks, that are, you know, a quarter the size, or in some cases, half the size of this room, about the same volume. And so the map of it that we would watch over the four years it was being built was by building a big Lego kit. That's exactly the way it was. They would just stick all these things together, put it all together, and then pretty soon a ship shows up. And, um, and so as we were watching the progress of it over time, you know, this, this module would be on, then this module would be put on, and this shipyard's so big that some of the modules were under construction, some were off being painted, some were off being wired, some were off doing all these different things, and then they'd all just show up in this massively huge building. And they'd put them all back together, and then, and then, then, then there's a ship. And uh, I'll show you about the launch in just a moment. And so I asked the question, I build decks, I work on the house at home, like all of us do here in Fairbanks. I said, so what kind of accuracy are you talking about when you take a chunk of ship, the quarter of the volume of this room, or half the volume of this room, and have to line it up with the other half? Totally different world than the way I build decks. They said, well, we can live with an eighth of an inch, you know, variance on something that big. I'm going, yeah, okay, I need you to work on my house. <clears throat> Then we had the keel laying ceremony. So what's the keel laying ceremony? This is left over from maritime history, where you put the names of the people who were going to like, you know, whack the champagne bottle over it and launch it. You put their names at the bottom of the ship down where the mast would be at the keel, and then go ahead and, and you have this big ceremony of, of, you know, we're building the ship and it's on its way and here's one of the big modules in the back. And the two people who had their names welded into the hull of the ship in this plaque, Vera Alexander, who many of you know, the first dean for the School of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences, first female PhD student uh, at the university, uh, her name and Bob Elsner, who's back over here, they had their initials welded into that plate, and that plate is now sitting at one of the deepest parts of the ship, down where the mast would be, would the mast go all the way down to the bottom. It doesn't have mast like that anymore, but it's left over maritime history, and uh, so we did the keel, lails, keel lane ceremony, which was also great fun and, and quite different. And like I said, eventually a ship shows up. And this is the building, Marinette Marine, uh, built on the Great Lakes. Uh, and it's about 260 feet, so the building's quite long. And at this point, it's about 80 to 100 feet high. And the ship's up on blocks. And eventually, I'm gonna show you a video here where you realize the ship is now too big to stay in the building. So it's that classic problem, you're building something in your basement, and then you realize you can't get it out through the basement door. <laughs> Same thing here, except in this particular case, they know they've gotta get it out. And so they've got it set up so they can roll it out and, uh, and have it all put together. And it goes through all the painting process, all the different quality control, all the welds are x-rayed, the whole shooting match there. Now, interestingly, right parallel to it on the other side, the uh, National Oceanographic Administration is building one of their research vessels right, right door next to us. And on the other side of that are some military ones that are going on at simultaneously big, big shipyard, and we had to go through all the security things because it was a military operation, and uh, we couldn't take pictures under various times and things, but, uh, 
but, but very fascinating process. And the reason we picked Marinette for the contract as opposed to New Orleans or Long Beach was because they had experience already building ice strengthened ferries to work in the Great Lakes. And it was a great shipyard anyway, very, very uh, modern and, uh, and worked out uh, well for uh, getting the ship not too far out of time, but under budget, of course, because it couldn't cost more than $200 million. These are the Z drives now actually in place as we were putting them on the ship. So if you think about this, the screw, ordinarily you think of a ship going along like this, right? And the screws are pushing the water this direction, pushing the ship this way. First of all, in the normal mode, they are facing forward and they're tractoring the ship. So they're actually pulling it, the water through. And part of this is so they can suck ice underneath it that gets broken up and get Met, uh, get uh, basically blended in the, in the props and then pushed out the back. But here's the cool thing about Z drives, they can rotate any direction this way on that vertical axis. They can rotate in any direction on the horizontal axis. You can spin the props in any direction and they can spin any way like this. So as a result, with the bow thrusters, which are like uh, a, uh, a, get, a jet on the front of the ship, the ship could, in actuality, sit there and spin on its center axis if it needed to, sitting in the same spot. It's pretty impressive, and it needs that ability to be able to maneuver in the ice and move and back and forth. And those tractors then can go in any direction. I've got video taken underwater of them, so you'll get to see them doing, uh, get to doing that trick. Oops. So eventually, it's time for the launch in October of, uh, of, of was October 13. And so here it is on the Menominee River. Uh, on this side of the river is Wisconsin. On this side of the river is Michigan. And it's being built there and it was taken out of the large building, put up there next to the river, ready to be launched. Here they are cleaning the props. So you get an idea of how big the props are. And for those of you that have a maritime history, uh, they are designed not for open water efficiency, but rather to be able to handle the heavy ice that they're going to be going into. So in reality, if we have to spend all of our time in open water, we would actually put a different set of props on that would have different pitch and different angles in order to be able to be a little bit more efficient in the water. When we launched it, we launched it sideways, and I'm going to show you a video of that. We knew about that from the people that were designing the launch and people that had seen, them, seen this before. But I can tell you right away, the only time they ever launch a ship and it actually can do something other than float is in the movies. It only happens in the movies. When they launch it, it's really just, it can float. That's about all it can do. But most people, because of the movies, are expecting the ship to launch backwards and then go sailing off to wherever it's going. I was standing, you'll see videos of this, I'm standing in the crowd of people around me who are expecting the ship to go sliding safely off backwards down into the river, and instead it keels over sideways and goes this <laughs> great panic, screaming, yelling, you'll hear that, going, oh my God, you know, the, sh you know, the ship's falling apart. And, and uh, a great video of that, it was, it was great fun. I was expecting, it didn't dawn on me, there'd be a couple hundred people standing around me who were expecting it to slide off backwards into the, into the water. Okay, so I'm going to go up here and I'm, the video I'm going to show you now is the process of how we actually moved it out of the building, some of the things we had to do with it, and then the launch itself. And uh, uh, like I said, you'll get to see uh, Bob Elsner here do some, some, some work since he was one of the people that was involved in getting it launched. So I'll talk my way through this as we go along. So this is just like how they moved the big uh, rockets at, at Cape Kennedy out on these big tractors, bring them out in like 120 wheels or something like that, and bring it out and move it along. And you notice as it comes into the, into the distance there that it doesn't have a bridge on it because that's not part of the Lego kit yet. There's the bridge. And we lower the bridge on and get it all attached and then it just continues to build. So here's the launch. This is Vera Alexander. She gets to break the champagne bottle. It's a cold, windy day. Get to do that. Okay, image taken from the, from the bow as we pull the explosive bolts to let it go in.
Ooh. Man, we really wanted to ride that in when it did that, but they wouldn't let us do that for safety reasons. Okay, we're gonna get a couple of views of this, and I'm gonna point a couple things out. First of all, I want you to watch what happens back here. All right, all right, we're gonna get another view of that in just a moment. All of us are safely back over here on the, on the back. Bob Elsner is standing right there, and you'll see him. Here's Bob. He got the privilege of pushing the button that blew the explosive bolts. Bob's back here. Here he is, he did that. You see the person in the blue? She knows what's happening. <laughs> Bob's back here, you can ask him afterwards what that was like. Well, I'll do one more version of this and then we'll, this goes on for a while, so we'll stop. This is phenomenal. This is from the Michigan side. And they've got a, a, a shallow channel there shut and watch this wave as it moves across because then it hits the shallows and comes way up high again as it comes up again here. And just a second where it hits that. There it comes up again now as it comes out of that channel. Well, this could keep going on because we have all these different views from the front from the back and, and all sorts of things. But it was a, but it was a, oh, I'll do this one because if you do get seasick, this is great. Of the, all of us are back there in the crowd back there, including all the ones who thought it was supposed to go off sideways. No, they wouldn't let us be on the ship. We wanted to, but we thought that would be great fun to let us ride it. But they said, no, there's no way they're letting anybody uh, safely ride on that ship. Okay, so here's quiz number one. I don't know how many of you are welders or do work with metal. I grew up in a welding shop. My dad had a welding shop. And I know that you cannot weld aluminum and steel together. Cannot happen. One of the design principles, remember we put the bridge on the top of the ship there, you saw us doing that a while ago. Very early on in the computer models, after they actually started building it, they realized the ship was too top heavy. And the only way they were gonna resolve that was either by lengthening it, which they did, and or reduce the superstructure weight on top. The way to reduce the superstructure weight is to make it out of aluminum instead of steel. Okay, so when you saw the bridge and that whole component being dropped on, it's all made of aluminum. The problem is the deck's all made of steel. How do you attach those two things? You don't want to just go along with some bolts and bolt it in. It's going to be doing that type of rolling in the open seas. You've got to weld it. You can't weld steel to aluminum. This is cool. They came up, the new bridge was made out of aluminum. The hull's made out of steel. How do you join it? They used explosive bonding of dissimilar metals. It's a controlled explosion between the layers. It plasticizes the metals and they bond. So we had, this, we had the steel on the bottom and I'm, I, I'll show you another picture of it and I've got a piece of it here for you to see it. Steel on the bottom, they coat the top of it with an explosive. They lay the aluminum over the top of that and then it's a controlled explosion that moves, high explosions, that moves its way along like that and superheats it, plasticizes it, and the two bond together. They're chemically bond together at this point. It's not glued, it's not bolted, it's not welded. They have become one. It is really a, 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 an interesting process. So the metals form into waves as the explosion moves along those pieces. So here's a picture of uh, aluminum on the top, tantalum in the middle, that's not what we have on the ship, and then stainless steel, and the explosion moves along in these ways. Pretty cool since it's a ship, and you're gonna have these little things like this. I love the disclaimer. Uh, it plasticizes the metals, intimate contact. They both, uh, the plasma surface is violently expelled during the reaction. A disadvantage of this method is extensive knowledge of explosives is needed before the procedure may be attempted. <laughs> I love it, that's really cool. So, here is a picture of the ship. It's this chunk of metal right here. Those of you that are metallurgists can come up and, and take a look at it. See the waves? Here's the aluminum on the top. The steel and the aluminum have bonded at the molecular level there. Here's the steel on the bottom. So they very simply welded the steel to the hull. 
and then aluminum TIG welded, those of you that know welding, the aluminum on the top of this piece to the aluminum superstructure, and now it's all welded to the ship. Really excellent, excellent solution to that particular problem. And I expect most of you weren't ready for a talk about metallurgy tonight, but this was just so interesting, I had to, I had to conclude, I had to throw it in. The other thing I have here, and I, I want to show it to you also, and you can come up and see it afterwards, is, is a piece of the hull. This is really heavy, and it's uh, three quarter inch to inch thick steel, doubled at the front. It's got the little plaque on it here that says, you know, we launched it on the state and everything. But the thing that's amazing about this, if you, if you think about it and see it and come up how heavy it is, they bent and formed this to form the shape of the hull. Those of you that have bent and formed, you know, very thin metal or very thin aluminum know that this is hard to do. Imagine doing on stuff that's an inch to two inches thick on sheets that are about 20 feet by 20 feet. And so they bent it, formed it, and uh, Bob Elsner was fascinated with that process and they had him, you know, show them how they actually did it. And they used big brakes, they, it's, but it's almost on a per person. There's a person out there with a little scale, he's measuring it, they're bending it some more, bending it some more, making it all fit. And if you can imagine that on a piece of metal that's 20 feet by 20 feet by one inch thick, bending it and forming it, it's pretty an incredible process. Don't do this at home. Well, you're not gonna do the explosives at home either, so uh, uh, this is not something you, you can do quite easily. Okay, so we've got a ship now. Um, I told you when it's launched, you can't really do anything, and that's true, it could float. And so it launched and sat in the river from October of uh, 13 um, until, um, uh, oh man, oh no, sorry, October of 12 until uh, June of 14. And they were able to sail it out of the Great Lakes and get it uh, on, its, on its way to it. So it's, it's mobile now, it's moving, it's got cranes on the back, it's got radar, it can start, it can stop, and can do all these types of things. Well, I've been telling you some interesting stories about the ship. I have two more to tell you right now, and we'll continue on. At this stage, uh, to be able to pass Coast Guard regulations for a ship this big, and this complex, you've got to be able to totally shut it down on the water, like turn it off, and then be able to turn it back on again. Makes sense? Except you've got to think about it. You've got massive diesel generators in there. You've got all sorts of systems there. How do you spin those up? There's nothing, there's no battery big enough to start a ship like that. Well, they start it with big volumes of compressed air. The compressed air spin up the turbines. The turbine spin starts generators and the whole thing flows along. The ship's, oh, three days out of Cleveland. They're doing some tests there. There's left Menominee, it's in Cleveland. And they have, um, the three generators going, they have the ability, they want to start the fourth one, they, they tell the computer to start the fourth one, the computer senses there's not enough air pressure to start the fourth generator, and most of you would understand the programming at that point would be, okay, can't start the fourth generator, we're just gonna have to keep going on the other three until you figure this out. Somewhere in that computer programming, and the, some of the computer guys are sitting there going, yeah, we know all about this, uh, afterwards, was it went, oh, there's no air pressure, shut all of them down. And so now we get a message from the ship in, in, uh, outside of Cleveland, dead in the water, can't start back up, generators down, Coast Guard upset. <laughs> <laughs> so as it turns out, we were able to manually go in, override some of the alarm systems and limp along on one screw uh, so that we were not adrift in the Great Lakes and flew in the software programmer from, from Denmark, I guess, is where they were coming in from, in order to solve one of these if, and, but, no, but, yes type things that you can think about, and go on and do that. Now, I'm gonna tell you another interesting story about getting it out of the Great Lakes in just a moment. So, uh, we built it here just outside of Green Bay, and it's a football team associated with that town, and, and uh, Amazingly, that airport's really, really small, and I keep thinking about the entire Green Bay Packers team flying in and out of there all the time, but anyway, we, we brought it out through here, down past uh, Detroit, up through the lakes, out, uh, ultimately through the St. Lawrence Seaway, Montreal, Quebec, came out, turned the corner, and came down here and headed over here to uh, Woods Hole, uh, uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which is right here. Okay. So, a lot of questions I had over the last three or four years were, how are we gonna get it to Alaska? I can tell you we did not send it by train. That was one of the, 
one of the options that people asked me about. We didn't take it apart and put it on trucks and ship it up here and reassemble it. That was also one of the questions I brought up. We did sail it the whole way through and then down through the Panama Canal and up and over. The only thing we found out is we had to pay cell roaming fees in Canada as we came through the Great Lakes here. We were in, a, in, we were in Quebec and the ship is all set up to have cell phone coverage and uh, we got the notice one day in the office that we had exceeded our cell phone usage and the ship, <laughs> all the cell phones and computers and everything were all shut down because we hadn't thought about the fact that we would be coming through Canadian waters. And you all know right now you want to go to Vancouver or something, you turn off your cell phone and you get killed with data charges, right? That's exactly what happened to us. So that was somewhere down on the list of things that we'll get to eventually, but they eventually caught up to us ahead of time. And so we had lots of email exchange back and forth, got the cell phone coverage back up and working, the computers back up and talking. And the master said, oh, that explains where everybody was leaving the ship to go to the, uh, all the local bars in order to use their computers. Uh, because the ship, was, the ship was cut off from cell phone service. So anyway, we brought it around and then brought it around down to Woods Hole, which was our first stop and where we were going to do some service on it. Okay, let's keep going here. So, let me back up. All through this area in here is where, whoops, come on Mike, you can do this. Where we go through the locks, there's a whole series of locks in here that you have to come through. And we are going to explore in this next video uh, coming through this lock right here. I'd never actually seen how the locks worked and it's all done in high speed. So it's, uh, it's pretty fun to watch.
I was fascinated in watching uh, that process of, of getting them out the locks. John, were you on that one? Yes, one of the people sitting here was with us uh, while that was happening. I can tell you some more about that in the, in the process. One last one here, then I'll turn it off before it gets dark. Drop down one of the last times. Uh, no, the entire trip was not filmed. Uh, it is possible that there are, you know, on people's individual um, cameras, uh, images that we're still getting, you know, from everybody who was on different parts of it. The question was how much of it, uh, how much of it was filmed. So we came around outside the Great Lakes, out through the St. Lawrence Seaway, down the East Coast, and then uh, Woods Hole was our first stop and the first chance for the National Science Foundation, the owners, to actually come and see it while it was working. We had press, we had media, we had senators, we had everybody showing up. The director of the Woods Hole coming on board. Uh, here's the bridge up on top. Here's the bridge from inside uh, getting, um, uh, getting a tour of what the bridge is like. This is the, the port drive, uh, or sorry, this is the captain's chair here. And, uh, and then working its way you know, along. And again, we're, we're, at, we're at Woods Hole there. Now, two interesting things about Woods Hole. We're at dock here, I'm standing up on top. Here's one of our little runaround boats. So I'm on, on the bridge looking down onto the starboard side and this is the pier. Fuel trucks coming in to fuel it because it's getting ready to go out, out to sea and do some work. And I want you to pay attention to this unit right here. That's this. And you can see they're running a cable onto the ship. I had no idea what they're doing. It's a great story. We have 10,000 meters of cable on that ship to allow for instruments to go to the bottom of the ocean and bring them back up again. Carry them up, put them down, carry them up, put them down. You're in salt water, you've got to have a lubricated uh, uh, lubrication on the cables, all those reasons you can imagine, keep it from corrosion and everything. They don't already come all greased up in oil. You've got to do that yourself. That's hard to do with several thousand meters of, of wire. So Woods Hole, very nice, has this device. They bring it out on the, out on the deck, out on the pier, they lock it to the pier, and then they spool off. So here's the ship over here with 10,000 meters worth of cable. They spool it all off onto these big spools, and then we spool it all back on, and when it's coming back on, they're lubricating it at the time so we can get the cable lubricated. Pretty tedious at you know, a meter or so a second. These guys sitting there 24 hours a day watching it, watching it, watching it as it comes back and forth. Sounds fine, theory works great, should be just no problem until this gets crushed from the, from the weight of the cable. The cable breaks at one point and now they've got, it's, it's, it's not totally broken but it's too stressed to continue on. This won't work. This is compromised. We're tied to the dock. We're not going anywhere at this point now because we can't run the cable off or on the ship. And so they had to come in, unwind it, put other stuff on, bring a new cable on, get it on. Eventually we were cut free from the deck or cut free from the ship or from the, uh, from the, from the pier. But an interesting process. And again, one of those things I get a call on the phone going, uh, we're sort of tied to the pier. And I go, yeah, I know you're tied to the pier. You've been tied there for two days. No, I mean, we're tied to the pier. We're not going anywhere because we've got the thousand meters of cable on each side of us that we can't do anything with. All solved, ship was, uh, out of there and, and, and away we're going. I know that there's a vast number of people in this room that have built your own houses and or been involved in construction projects and know what punch lists are in terms of all the little red dots and things, this doorknob isn't working right or the hot water tap isn't working correctly. Now you've got a complicated building that has to be able to work at sea doing the same thing and the punch list is huge but reasonable. And so I've seen the warranty list, which is massive. You all have a warranty on your washer, you got a warranty on your car, we've got a warranty on the ship. And uh, all those warranties are cracking their way through right now, and uh, when we finish it up in June or July, we'll have the one-year warranty on it. And, uh, and we're still working through those things, and I get to see the, the list of the punch list things. But it's working, and it's, it's made its way along. Okay, when we were in Woods Hole, we found out that for some reason one of the like gazillion antennas up on the top was not working well. 
So we send somebody who's not afraid of heights, puts on his safety gear up all the ladders, up over the top, comes up over the top and everything, comes up to the top, finds a bad connection, but also finds that one of the other antennas is not working well, and that's because it had a bird's nest built into the middle of the, into the, middle of the antenna. We have no idea where the nest came from. We think it actually came from the uh, uh, area when it was up in Wisconsin and made it all the way down to, uh, made it all the way down to Woods Hole. But they did fix that, uh, they did fix that uh, component of the, of, the, of the antenna at the time and uh, be, able to, uh, be able to get it going. So uh, it was interesting from high-tech connections with very high satellite uh, image problems uh, you know, to a bird's nest uh, causing, causing issues. But it worked and we left Woods Hole. Now you have the mandatory picture you got to have your picture taken in the captain's chair, right? Everybody wants to do this one. So there, there, you've got like the director of Woods Hole here. You've got a senator here. But there are two people, two ones here I want to show you. Bob Elsner again, this time in the plywood version of the deck chair, <laughs> sitting there taking a look at it, talking with a couple friends, and Terry Whitledge, who was the Institute of Marine Science uh, director, faculty member, and this is his baby. I mean, he's been working on this project as the principal investigator for it for 10 years and was deeply, deeply, still remains deeply involved in it. Uh, so he and Bob are sitting there talking about it. This is the keel lane ceremony because there is no ship yet. Uh, but there was a plywood version of the captain's chair. And now this is uh, some time later, again, Bob, there in the back at the actual launching ceremony. And uh, at that point, the ship is all still covered up in plastic and uh, not ready to be uh, uh, run yet. But in its working version here and here, uh, you'll notice there's no great big wheel right in the center. It's because we don't have a rudder. So there's no, you can't be spinning it in the middle of a storm trying to get the ship to move. Uh, it's all being run just by little joysticks. So the, uh, you know, Captain Kirk thing is, th that joke's getting pretty old now in terms of Star Trek and being in the captain's chair. But, but uh, that's pretty much what it's like. Uh, you're able to run it. You're also able to run it. There's an entire control room in the back that looks out over the back aft deck. The aft deck on the ship is huge. It's like 100 feet from the back towards where the first uh, uh, buildings are, the, the structures. That's really big for an oceanographic vessel. And we have a whole control room in the back so we can drive the ship backwards if we need to because in some cases it's easier to break ice backwards. And overlooking that deck, they can see the cranes, they can see all the activity, they can watch all the science happening and run the ship from the back. So you got four places you can drive it uh, with the joystick and watching, uh, watching it work. We doing on time. We're doing just about right on time here. Okay, so we brought it. Here's Woods Hole up here. Brought it down uh, into the some of the deep areas off Puerto Rico uh, for um, uh, some tests. Out of Puerto Rico, then through the Panama Canal. Here's the little map. We have a tracker on the ship, so that any given time you can go onto the website, which is this website here, and be able to see where the ship is. Took it from. Um, the Panama Canal out to Hawaii and the reason go okay that's not really on the way to Alaska what's the story it's because the National Science, Science Foundation determines where and when the ship is going and the first two science projects they wanted to test were in the very deep waters out here to the northwest of Hawaii and Guam is over here and so they ran out back and forth here and then over to Guam it was in Guam last week and is now on its way up to Ketchikan, but the first operations were here. Those of you also know that around in here are there a lot of uh, marine monuments that are controlled zones, and so we have to have the hull inspected to make sure we weren't, didn't have any invasive species attached to the hull, any animals that weren't supposed to be on the hull uh, before we could get into the marine protected areas. I'll show you about that in just a moment. So the way you do that, you want to inspect the hull, is you've got to send divers down. Or in the modern world, you can start with a GoPro on a, on a little uh, a bamboo pole and run it underneath and see what the hull looks like. So that's this video. No, no music set to this one. So I'll talk our way through. So pop it down. This is open ocean Hawaiian waters, very, very clear. See it's drawing about 18 feet at that point. Now here are the screws. We're going to sort of exercise this one, the, the, the port one, the starboard one stable. We're going to rotate it around so it's now facing the, 
facing the camera here in just a moment. Speed it up, turn it. You see it start to cavitate some air bubbles towards us there at that point a little bit. Spinning pretty fast. Turn it back around again as they're doing all the tests on it. So these are both can rotate, like I said, in all these different directions. And the props can go in either direction and it can spin on its vertical axis 360 degrees. So this is in Hawaii, taking a look at the hull, which we have to clean uh, before we can head uh, into the monuments. So, this becomes a very interesting question now for those of you interested in UAF public relations. We operate this ship for the National Science Foundation. Not all the cruises are uh, necessarily going to have UAF research projects on it. In fact, probably most of them won't. There'll be research teams from all over the United States and international teams also. So when they're out there doing their work, and I'm gonna direct this to the public relations people here in the audience, who's responsible for the public relations from Woods Hole when they're on the ship? Now we're operating it, do we ask them to take pictures for us and give it to us? Do they put up their own blogs? Do they put up their own websites? Does NSF do it? What's our responsibility? We're trying to figure all that out in terms of what are our responsibilities. If you've got a grant to work on the ship, but you're from the University of North Carolina, you don't have to give us anything. <laughs> you know, so there's all this kind of stuff we're trying to work out. However, as it turns out, on the cruises in and out of Hawaii, uh, Woods Hole and uh, Michigan and uh, which is the other one, University of Houston, were big into making blogs and stuff, so it's great. It's all over the web, and they've got all sorts of cool things that they were doing, uh, including putting the Sentry over the side, which is a remotely operated vehicle that could go very, very deep. And so deep, in fact, that our job was to set it free and then tow a package at three or 4,000 meters that would communicate with it while it was deeper and so that we could talk to, talk to the remotely operated vehicle. And uh, they had it all decorated for Christmas, so it's got a little Christmas ears on it and all sorts of things. But a separate vehicle out there that could do that. A magnetometer that they dropped over the side because they were trying to measure how the mid-ocean uh, ridge, how the magnetic fields change as the, as the continental plates move against one another. Now the fascinating thing for me on that particular study on this version. Remember the cruise that I said I was pretty sure I was going to die because I was going to be six weeks out there and sick on the first two days? It was to measure exactly the same thing. The magnetic structure of the bottom of the Pacific Ocean out near Hawaii. So clearly we've got some geologists in the crowd here tonight. It's a very important place to be doing these types of measurements and geology moves fairly slowly. So even though it's the fact that I did it 30 years ago and we just did it again now, probably not that much has changed in 30 years in the rocks. But they're out there doing the magnetic work working at night time, and this one's cool. Here's, a, here's an idea, I had no idea this was done. I have crossed the Dateline before, I've crossed the equator before, you have all these things, I've crossed the Southern Antarctic Circle before, and all these different uh, rituals that you have to go through when you do all this kind of stuff. What I didn't know is that when you cross the Marianas Trench, the deepest part of the world's oceans, they throw a steel plate over with everybody's names engraved on it to the bottom at 10,000 meters. Which means probably there's a whole bunch of steel plates sitting at the bottom of the Marianas Trench that somebody's gonna find someday. Anyway, this is on the University of Houston Woods Hole and everybody else's uh, uh, websites. We finished that cruise and came into Guam, which we were there just 10 days ago. We had people there, we're working with the University of Guam, who was proud to announce the research vessel Sekuliak visited Guam. Uh, and then they're on their way up, I'll show you a picture in a minute, towards Ketchikan, uh, only to discover that a ship that's built to do well in ice doesn't necessarily do well in big seas. And so now they've like, they're ratcheting down all the instruments and they're chaining things down and all sorts of stuff because I guess they're rocking and rolling all over the place. And I am so glad I'm not on it right now. <laughs> so here it is as of yesterday afternoon, en route to Ketchikan. All, we have all the Alaska homecoming events. We'll be in Ketchikan next week for its arrival. Tours, VIPs, everybody getting on board to see it. We'll bring it up the inside 
uh, uh, passage there to uh, Juno. Again, more VIPs, tours, etc., for the ship to be able to be seen by the legislators and people in Juno. And then the really big event, uh, the 6th, 7th, and 8th in, in Seward, is when we commission it. Uh, we bring, we're inviting basically anybody who wants to come down uh, or up, depending on where you are, to come and see the ship, get tours, talks. It's all going to be at the rail station there. And its home base, of course, is in Seward. And that's our next couple of weeks. It's going to be very busy, but very fun as we welcome it in its home company as it gets back for the first time to Alaska. Got to throw a plug in for the School of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. That is the group that is in charge of operations, maintenance, finance, everything else, uh, SFOS and uh, Dean Braddock uh, keeping track of the ship as it um, goes on its mission. Uh, that's the website. This was a great picture of a lightning strike near it when it was in uh, Woods Hole. Some of the instruments going off the sides, breaking ice. It's getting ready to go off some ice trials in the Bering Sea soon. And this classic picture of it sailing through Puerto Rico. Hopefully you've all been tweeting uh, tonight as we've been going along. We'll check to see how that, how that happened. I have enjoyed talking to you. There's lots and lots of stories. This could go on for another two hours of weird things that have happened, uh, normal things that have happened, uh, fun things, some of the science missions that are going on. But I wanted to give you just a, a flavor of some of the things that you wouldn't ordinarily hear about from how you explosively bond metal uh, all the way to why you pay your cell phone charges even when you're a ship. And no, they do not have a family ship plan uh, through, <laughs> through uh, GCI. Thank you very much. This has been very fun, and I'll answer questions. <laughs>